Tea, Coffee, Murder, Episode 2, The Final Words of Ian O'Shelley, written by Ellen Barksdale, narrated by Jessica Whittaker. Prologue, in which a bloody deed is arranged by telephone. The dial tone sounded a few times. A calm voice answered. Yes. Do you know who this is? said the caller. Of course. Do you have the information? It's the travel date we discussed. Nothing has changed. Good. He's reliable then? Like a Swiss clock. You know they're not as reliable as the Swiss like to think, really reliable watches. I don't need to know this. The caller was not feeling patient. It can never hurt to know things, but it can hurt not to know things. Are you some sort of philosopher? You don't have to have studied philosophy to have intelligent conversation. Can we get back to business? The caller was wondering if this person was up to the job. The voice laughed. You're in a hurry, aren't you? I'm in no hurry. I'd just like to end this conversation. How will you proceed? You'll see, came the reply, not seeming too upset by their counterpart's tone. I would like to know. The more you know, the greater the risk of you letting something slip. As you prefer. But can I count on you to get the job done? I have never left a target alive. Good. The money's on its way to you. It's already here. The call ended. The caller held the phone to their ear for another moment, then switched the device off and put it in the drawer. Soon the problem would be solved, and for good. Chapter One In which various encounters take place, some of which are momentous. No, I don't deny it. I murdered Robert Tennant. Christine Langley said calmly, brushing a strand of hair from her face. I had to. He was a bully, a coward, a devil. A teacher who drove two boys to their deaths, shamed them and encouraged others to treat them like fools, he's to blame. She shook her head. And worse, worse than the fact that he drove those boys to kill themselves? Christine looked ahead with a penetrating gaze. He mocked them afterwards said they had finally found some guts. She nodded emphatically. He had to die, not just for revenge, but to protect others, the innocent. She rolled her eyes. No, detective, the school did nothing. The school cared more about sporting triumphs than the lives of two clever, sensitive boys. Tenants' victories counted for more with the school administration than a handful of students falling by the wayside. Killing him was the only way. And Claire Tennant? Well, she tried to stop me. Tried to protect her loving husband, huh? Christine shrugged her shoulders. If you want to protect bad people, then you can't be a good person, can you? She paused as if listening to a voice. You almost prevented me from punishing Claire. You know how I feel about that, don't you? I'm sorry, it has to end like this. Then she reached for the pistol lying on the table to her right and fired three shots. The lights went out and thunderous applause erupted. Wow, that was impressive, Natalie said to her cook Louise, who was standing with a torch by the switches that turned the various lights in the pub on and off. She flipped one switch after another, being careful to do so slowly, not wanting to break the spell the audience were under and bring them back from the play to reality too quickly. Very, said Louise. 
After ten minutes, I was completely captivated. Natalie nodded and looked around. Judging by the applause, the audience agrees. Eighty or so guests had gathered in the tap room of the cosy pub. The play had been completely sold out, but about a dozen stragglers had been allowed to stand at the back. Louise, always conscious of safety, had wanted to keep to the announced number of audience members, but Natalie had finally persuaded her to squeeze a few more in. After all, those stragglers were our regular and beloved paying customers. The audience were all chatting animatedly, making their way to the tables on the terrace in front of the pub. It was a good idea to extend the terrace into the car park tonight, Louise noted, as she saw people streaming outside, where the waiters were already waiting to take their drink orders. Natalie nodded in agreement. You've done well, Louise. I do my best. Natalie looked at the older woman. A little more than six weeks after taking over the black feather, she was in some respects still a mystery to her. If what she said was true, she was a former agent for a still unnamed UK intelligence service. How had she put it? There's nothing secret about a secret service if everyone knows it exists. An internet search for anything other than the known secret services was fruitless. Louise would have something more to say about it once they'd known each other a little longer, Natalie told herself. Well, this evening was your idea, Natalie, Louise added appreciatively. I take my imaginary hat off to you. It went brilliantly. Louise was unaware just how grateful Natalie was that the night had gone without a hitch. She had come up with the idea following a performance in the local church hall. A theatre troupe on tour with the stage version of Arsenic and Old Lace had played to a half-empty hall. This wasn't because there was no interest in the event. The locals had attended with enthusiasm. Rather, the hall was a bit oversized by today's standards. Fifty or sixty years ago, when television and internet did not provide round-the-clock entertainment, they might have been looking at a full house. It had got Natalie thinking. If the same performance had been held in her pub, it would have been a sellout. The Black Feather had just enough room to be able to accommodate an audience. And suddenly, a sparsely attended night of Amdram in the church hall could be described as a standing room only sellout gig at the Black Feather. She had checked the listings in some theatrical magazines and, to her delight, found a local actress looking for experience in small venues. To her relief, the night was a success. Could it be repeated? She hoped so, but it was hard to say. Tonight's performance had been an adaptation of a little known short story, Convicted by the famous writer Ian O'Shelley, and therefore something rather out of the ordinary, which might have attracted more interest than the upteenth stage version of Arsenic and Old Lace. Miss Langley, you were outstanding, Louise said suddenly, bringing Natalie out of her thoughts. Christine Langley, the actress in the play, had joined them. Thank you very much, she replied, almost embarrassed. She was more than half a head shorter than Natalie, in her mid-twenties, and so delicately built that you'd be afraid to hug her. That's nice of you. While she was talking, she was approached by some audience members who shook her hand and wanted to take a selfie with her. Let's get you a drink, said Louise. The young woman managed to make her way through the audience to the bar and took a seat. The many compliments she had received on the way ensuring she was visibly blushing. A beer? asked Natalie. Just water, please, the actress said, untying her long, honey-blonde hair so that she could retie it tighter. I can't hold my drink, and when I'm as warm as I am right now, even less so. She smiled fleetingly. Besides, being on stage tonight was intoxication enough. Is this the first time you've done a monologue like this, all on your own? Louise put the glass of water down for her. Christine nodded and fanned herself. That's right. And I was so nervous. In a normal play, you have at least two or three cast members who can help you if you get stuck. But like this, all I could do was improvise and hope no one would notice. You did really well, Natalie said. The young woman blushed. It could have gone better 
if you notice. 